And again, going out of order, our next witness is Nancy Horgan. Swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is true? It is true, 100%. Okay. And state your name. And My name is Nancy Horgan, and if I just might make a couple of comments on um, the fact that um, how much I appreciate. I'm from Rhode Island. I appreciate the opportunity uh, for this assembly to hear this today. There was, to my knowledge, no public discourse on the sealing of these records. No one was able to hold a hearing like this and say, everybody stand up who wants these records closed. They were just closed for reasons that we all don't understand or sort of understand, but there was nobody listening at that time to decide, is it a good idea going forward? It went forward, and it's been a failed experiment. The other thing is um, we heard someone talk today about a smoke screen that this um, health, um, this is a health bill and it's a smoke screen for people just being curious. I, have, I agree that there's a smoke screen going on here, 100%. We heard it in Rhode Island for 30 years and we worked on the uh, passage of our legislation there. But the smoke screen isn't about the needs of the adult adoptee. The smoke screen is crafted by the people who, um, in my opinion, um, have money involved in continuing the status quo. And their smoke screen of protecting us, the birth parents, um, has to stop. That's the smoke screen going on here. There is one, and that's it. The other thing is that the state is not the only repository of information. Okay, birth mothers are found all the time, up and down the street, in every state, everywhere. No hairy carry is going on. There's no big um, headlines or issues or lawsuits or you know suicides that we're aware of that are in such mass that we need to keep these records closed because someone might find out. They're already finding out everywhere. Uh, some others don't want contact. Absolutely, I know some. I've been in contact with birth mothers that um, are so steeped in shame. It's been reinforced in their life for so many decades. They can't step away from it. I also know the adult adoptee children of these birth mothers who honor that necessity to deal with this issue in their own way. Adult adoptees aren't inherently bad people. The last thing they want is more rejection. They don't really go into this to ruin the lives of women who said, I haven't told, I can't tell. I know some, there's some in my own family. I'm 63 years old. I've spent the last 60 years as a citizen of Rhode Island. In 1968, while no 17-year-old unmarried father had any such restriction, I was removed from school, prohibited by law to attend while I was pregnant. I was immediately deemed to be of no worth to my unborn child as a more deserving adoptive married couple was sought. Ultimately, I was, set for, I was sent to a home for unmarried mothers to await delivery. This home, although filled to capacity with pregnant and adolescent women during my entire stay, offered no visits to any hospital. We never saw the inside of a delivery room. We had no childbirth classes. We had no counseling of any options regarding the future plan for our children. I was offered no information regarding my rights as his mother. Indeed, in spite of my strenuous objections, I was not even offered an option to hold my child once he was delivered. I was not offered an opportunity to see my child until I signed termination papers. And in the end, I was not ever offered even a moment to hold him and to say goodbye. That was denied to me. And in, in an act I could not, that could not be seen as more deplorable, I was not offered a chance to recover from a frightening, difficult, and painful childbirth alone before I was asked to acknowledge that I was not able to parent my child and to surrender my rights as his mother. In order to return home, I was offered no option other than to agree to eliminate the father of my child from my life. I was not offered an option to grieve the loss of this baby, but I was told to never speak of this child again. 
I was to live as though this life-changing experience had never occurred. I was not offered the option to retain even one beloved memento of this my first pregnancy, but advised not to complain when, when asked to dispose of any material evidence of this birth. I was not offered nor allowed one shred of legal documentation to his birth or his adoption, including documents I was advised to sign. They just simply took him away. But what I was offered something, and what I was offered from all fronts was the no choice sealed for life adoption system. I did not choose this system that was in place in Rhode Island with all its secrets and lies and myths and one choice options. But because I was unmarried when I delivered this baby boy in 1968, it chose me. And in no uncertain terms, I was told to forget he happened and go on with my life. But he wasn't gone from my life and I was not gone from his. We were both present too and absent from each other. We tried to adapt to a circumstance that basically very few humans are asked to do. Living with this unresolved grief and confusion of a quasi loss overshadowed the joy I sought for in my 20 year marriage at the time and the successful raising of two more children. And I might just say, Losing a child to adoption is like losing a child in the woods and you know they're out there somewhere and the moral push as a mother is to find and help this child you don't know where they are. It overshadows just about everything you do. I knew he was out there somewhere but I had no idea where. And finally in an effort to take control of my life, when I was 38, I did find the resolve to turn from the choices that were made for me to make my own choice to find my son. In 1989, in spite of the no choice system firmly in place in Rhode Island that prohibited my then 21 year old son and I from identifying to each other, we did. We actually did. Rhode Island, the state of Rhode Island isn't the only repository of information either. Even as an unenlightened Unenlightened, even as unenlightened as society was in 1989, our reunion did not cause the sky to fall as predicted. To the contrary, an enormous amount of healing began to take place in both of our lives. And now 25 years later, we are as close as any mother and son could possibly be as he sits in this room with me today. He is still a much loved member of his adoptive family and his original family on both sides cherishes his existence and participation in our shared experiences. It has been these choices, not the ones forced upon me in 1968, that it said that I had, that I didn't have, that has brought our families an enviable and deserving measure of closeness. It was in 1989 that I joined the growing movement in Rhode Island to address the issue of the no choice, sealed for life ad adoption system. I already knew my son at that time, but as with all Rhode Island born adult adoptees, he was discriminated against with regard to being able to freely access his true unaltered birth certificate like every other non-adopted citizen. He has a right to have what my other children have and although we as advocates of truth knew that we were on the right side of history, we had a thunderous pushback for decades, just like in New York, from powerful, a handful of powerful lawmakers who tied up bills even for heavily restricted passive registries for decades. We were told that access to information would spawn lawsuits against the state if previously sealed information were to be made available to registrants, even if all parties to the adoption and the court agreed to it, that it would spell the end of adoption in Rhode Island. Many of us who have lived this experience spent another quarter century in Rhode Island struggling to educate the woefully uninformed public and members of our General Assembly until we met with success in 2011. And since that law restored Unrestricted access for adult adoptees became effective in July 2012. The Rhode Island Department of Health has issued nearly a thousand original birth certificates. 
with, I might say, no fanfare at all. Life just went on. No sky has fallen, no headlines of lawsuits have been filed. Unrestricted access created nary a peep from any corner. It simply serves those who choose to take control of their lives and make their own adult choices. And this includes original parents. By provision of a contact preference form, original parents can finally inform an adult adoptee of their choice not to be contacted if this is their desire. And there are some out there. People who wish to be left alone can remain protected by the police department. It cannot and should not be a matter of the state. The contact print for form allows the only option for original parents to express a true choice without infringing on the rights of their adult offspring to know the truth. And with due respect to the state of New York, you are engaging in a huge disservice to original families by implying that you can guarantee their anonymity. Acknowledging that in 2014, guaranteed anonymity is simply, is simply no longer the case would help all parties make informed choices on how to proceed. Ditching the secrets and shame would be the obvious remedy as opposed to continuing to serve up false hope that the state can protect a secret. Thousands of reunions have occurred since adoption records were sealed retroactively in 1940, including the people who were promised that they would be open. The human desire cannot be altered with a stroke of a pen. The draconian state mandated no choice sealed for life system does not stop families from reuniting with each other. It just costs them small fortunes and creates undue hardship, hurt and havoc in lives of those who are seeking answers. Every person sitting here today, although there's two, I thought there would be 10, um, has the opportunity to, go, to overcome this insidious, hollow opposition in the state of New York. We had it in Rhode Island too. We had every single same argument. We promised. The opposition doesn't have a leg to stand on. Few of any of them have walked in the shoes of a surrendering parent or an adult adoptee. Their fears are unfounded, and yet they are able to survive due to the pressures of the burgeoning adoption industry and politics. And I urge you to take the bold step that our state has taken and be done with this travesty of justice. I urge you to seek support from your colleagues to pass this long overdue legislation, and until then, we will not rest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.